Hi everyone and welcome to our April Agency to Agency webinar, Social Media and FOIA in 2019. This is going to be a special training with Nikel Allen, the Director of the Office of Open Government. So we'd just like to start off telling you a little bit about the webinar series. This is our agency to agency webinar, webinar series, which we do monthly. And in the past year, we've had more than 4,000 of you come by to a webinar. So we're really excited about that. You can see some of the guests we've had over the years. We've had topics on everything from how to do graphic design for social media, how to do live video for social media, how to do social media during a large event like the Super Bowl. So definitely stay tuned because we've got these coming every month and we're excited about today's, the latest in the series. Just a little housekeeping, if you're a regular guest on our series, you know all of these things, but I'll go through them quickly so everybody is on mute. Um, if you have a question, there's a place where you can submit your question and where that is, you'll see you have a control panel for GoToWebinar. So just go over there on the right where you'll see a panel for questions and you can just type your questions in there um, and you can select for them either to go just to me or to the group. And um, there'll be time for Q&A throughout the presentation. And also, we're going to set aside a block of time at the end. So please, feel free to send your questions through as soon as you have them in the chat window. And just, just to make sure everybody kind of understands how that works, if you want to just say hello or say the word yes in the chat window, just so I know that, that everybody can use it, feel free to put that in there right now. Perfect. I'm seeing some some yeses and some hellos coming through, so that's great. Thank you so much. Okay, so on to the exciting part of the day. So today our topic is social media and FOIA in 2019. And I'll talk a little bit about Nikel in a minute. She's going to talk for about 30 to 40 minutes. And then I'm Stephanie Hawkins. I'm the content marketing manager at Archive Social. And I'm going to talk a little bit about something that we like to call CYA, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later, for about five minutes. And then we will spend the rest of the time getting all your questions answered. Um, you'll definitely receive a recording of this if you want to share it with other people at your agency afterwards as well. So a little bit about Nikel. We're really excited to bring in Nikel as a guest. Um, you know, normally we have PIOs and communicators and IT directors come on as our guests, and today we've kind of got somebody a little bit different. Um, she is the FOIA officer and the director of the Office of Open Government in D.C., which she'll tell you a little bit more about, but essentially it's an independent office within the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability. So her job is really to train and advise agencies on FOIA and the Open Meetings Act. And she investigates complaints, assists agencies in the implementation of open government best practices and things like that. And she brings over 19 years of experience as a DC government attorney to this role. Um, previously served as an assistant AG for the district as well as the senior policy advisor and counsel for the office of the chief technology officer. And we're based in Durham, North Carolina, so we're excited to see that that she um, also went to school in North Carolina. She has her BA from UNC Chapel Hill and her JD from North Carolina Central. So before we jump into things here, Nikel and I talked um, beforehand. We just were interested in finding out a little bit about you, those of you who are on the call today. Um, you know, we want to make sure that this training is really geared towards you. And so to that end, we've got a couple of polls we'd like to launch just to kind of find out where you are in your understanding of these things. And what I'd like to start off with is, that you'll see this pop up in a moment, um, is what is your role at your agency? You can just kind of let us know this. Fill this out, I'll put it up there for about 10 seconds. And I see some, some numbers coming in. Keep that up for a few more seconds there. Okay, and just to show you all the results, um, this is pretty interesting. So we've got 60% of you are in the PIO communicator role, 23% are clerk or admins, IT 19%, and then other. So if you have an other and you want to type it into the chat window, feel free. But that is great. Um, great. So let's do, a, let's do another quick poll, and that one is, um, does your agency conduct government business? 
Here, I'll launch it here so you can see the wording. Does your agency conduct government business meetings, advice, complaint responses using social media? Okay, perfect. And so to share the results from that poll, we've got 77% of you say yes, your agency conducts business using social media. 23% say no. Okay, great. Let's do just a couple more here, because um, I think this will really help Nikel. And Nikel, I'm sure you probably agree, just to know kind of where everybody stands on this. So this one is, have you ever conducted a public meeting using social media? And you can either so you can either select yes, no, or no, but we would like to in the future, because I know a lot of agencies uh, have not done that yet, but that's something that's kind of around the corner for them. Okay, great. And the results are 22% of you have conducted a public meeting on social media, 70% have not, and 7% looking to do it in the future. Okay. And then last but not least, before we launch into Nikel's section, this is an interesting one considering that I know a lot of you are communicators.
Let me get it. Oh, you can. All right, it seems like our audio issues may be fixed at least on one end of the spectrum. Um, if everybody can hear me now, if you can just say yes in the chat window, that'd be super helpful. And then we need to see how we can get Mikkel back in. So sorry about this. Thanks for bearing with us while we're figuring this out. Okay, I'm talking now. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Oh, oh, great, great. Okay, um, all right. Let me um, let me start again. I switched over from the phone to um, to my headset, so um, hopefully that'll work out. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, so uh, my name is Nikel Allen, um, and this presentation is um, Social Media and the Freedom of Information Act 2019. I'm very excited um, to present on this topic um, because of the um, prevalence of social media use by um, the government now. Um, so the presentation contents are, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction about my office and about FOIA and social media. And then I'm gonna talk about government record keeping. Um, next, uh, social media and FOIA cases, um, social media policy, and then I will talk about social media retention, document retention. So who we are, who are we? <laughs> the DC Office of Open Government is an office within the DC Board of Ethics and Government Accountability. And we're an independent agency and we serve as a government watchdog and we assure um, government openness and transparency according to District of Columbia law. And we also enforce the Open Meetings Act and provide advice concerning compliance with the DC Freedom of Information Act. Um, DC law authorizes this office to issue advice advisory opinions and to give formal uh, FOIA advice. What is FOIA? As most of you know, the Freedom of Information Act is a law that gives the public the right to access information from the government. And under FOIA, agencies must release information that is requested unless that information is protected from disclosure. Um, the Freedom of Information Act on the federal side was enacted in 1967, and it gives citizens access to public information held by federal agencies. Um, in most states, uh, there are individual FOIA laws. In DC, uh, FOIA was enacted in 1973, um, just 77 years after the federal counterpart. Um, DC FOIA gives any person the right upon request to inspect records held by public bodies, which is a, a defined term in DC. Um, and it means DC government agencies, independent agencies, other governmental entities, and the DC council. Now I'm gonna next just give a brief introduction of government use of social media. Um, social media is a complex topic from both the legal and policy standpoint. So this presentation is gonna focus on the intersection between social media and FOIA. Um, as government and government officials are increasingly relying on social media to communicate with the public, they are becoming increasingly aware of the corresponding public records responsibilities related to conducting government business using social media. And I see that a lot of you do that. Um, so hopefully this presentation um, will assist you going forward. Um, 
managing social media content from a record keeping perspective is paramount to maintaining transparency and being able to comply with FOIA requests or open records requests um, for that information. Um, social media services, as you know, have transformed the ability of citizens to communicate uh, and interact with the government. Um, even though, as, as I stated earlier, most state and federal laws were drafted decades ago, they still apply to social media content. Um, the FOIA laws have adapted over time to capture advanced technology. Like, for example, um, email is widely considered a public record. So like email, uh, social media um, is a public record in some instances. Public business, meetings, correspondence, and the like that happen on a social uh, media page for the government are likely subject to FOIA law. So the next topic I'm going to discuss is the government's electronic record retention responsibilities. So state and federal FOIA laws require governments to retain and produce electronic records such as emails, government social media accounts, um, and co constitute records that uh, of the conduct of government business, and they need to be preserved and produced under FOIA law. Uh, state laws typically require agencies and organizations doing business with the government to preserve this digital content. Emails, text, social media must be archived and produced to the public pursuant to FOIA laws in most states. Now I'm going to go over briefly the, the uh, FOIA law in DC. Um, DC FOIA gives the public the right to request, inspect, and or duplicate public records. Public records is a defined term in DC and it includes all paper, books, maps, photographs, cards, tapes, recordings, and other documentary materials regardless of physical form, which is key, or characteristics prepared, owned, or used in the possession of or retained by a public body. So basically in DC, public records specifically include electronic records. Um, so next I'm going to go over um, some jurisdictions, other jurisdictions, uh, state FOIA laws for purpose of illustration and so you can see what's going on um, nationally. So in Texas, um, which is modernized in 2013 um, is a really good example of a FOIA law um, that's really on point. Um, the uh, Texas state law provides, uh, it includes electronic communication, the general form in which the media containing public information exists include email, internet posting, text message, instant message, and other electronic communication. So that other electronic communication, that's where you're going to find a requirement um, for social media. Um, Texas goes on to further say content posted by the agency or the public on an agency's social media website is a state record and is subject to state record retention requirements. So if you're in the state of Texas, it's very clear um, that you're supposed to preserve this social media content if you are conducting government business using social media. Um, Massachusetts uh, public record law defines public records as all documentary materials or data, regardless of physical form or characteristics made or received by any officer or employee of the Commonwealth or of any political subdivision thereof, unless such materials or data fall within one or more of the exemptions under the law. Um, this definition includes electronic documents and other data. Massachusetts policy guidelines also say public entities that use social media should be aware that most social media sites are hosted by third party providers. Therefore, public entities need to ensure procedures are implemented to preserve social media data in light of this problem. Um, so later in the presentation, we're going to talk about um, preserving social media and the best way to do it. Um, the Arizona Attorney General issued an opinion in 2015 stating that Arizona's public officials' text messages and social media activity are a public record 
if the information is related to their official roles. So electronic messages sent or received by a government issued electronic device or through a social media account provided by a government agency for conducting government business is a public record. And you're going to see this theme um, of government business uh, on social media um, being repeated uh, frequently um, throughout this presentation because it is key. You know, what are, not just that you have the social media, but what are you doing um, on the social media? Um, so the Georgia Public Records Act states, public access to public records should be encouraged to foster confidence in government. This means all public records should be made available for access when an open records request is made. In fact, Georgia's Open Records Act specifically addresses electronic messages, whether in the form of email, text message, or other format as a public record. So that jurisdiction as well um, is including social media um, in its definition of what is a record. And I think that's very, very important to note. So in your jurisdiction, like when you're looking at FOIA, you know, make sure to take a look at um, the the language that talks about electronic, because that usually means that your jurisdiction is going to have um, social media retention requirement. Um, so next, I'm going to go over some recent social media cases. Um, I won't get into the weeds with this. This is definitely lawyer stuff, but it's interesting um, to know what courts are saying. Um, because they give good guidance uh, on how it should be handled and it will help you when you're crafting a policy. Um, and it also gives clarity um, to what the FOIA requirements are. So um, these are not uh, DC cases, there's one federal case, but these are from um, states. So here we go. Um, so a West but versus city of Puyallup, I, I hope for our Washington people I said that uh, correctly. Uh, so this is a Washington state case about whether post by an elector, elected official on her personal Facebook page are public records subject to the Washington State Public Records Act called the PRA. Um, in this case, Arthur West made a PRA request for records related to a council member Julie Doerr's Facebook page. The lower court in this case held that the personal Facebook page was not subject to the Public Records Act, even though the owner of the page was an elected official. The Court of Appeals affirmed and articulated this standard. A public official's post on a personal Facebook page can constitute a public record if, one, the post relates to the conduct of government, and two, are prepared within a public official scope of employment or official capacity. The court held that the city did not prepare the Facebook post at issue here because the council member, Ms. Doerr, did not prepare the post within the scope of her employment or in her official capacity as a council member. So she was not conducting public business, nor was she furthering the city's interest by the post. So the court held um, this was not a public record. Um, so let's go over to some brief facts of this case. So um, Wes submitted a public records request to the city that asked for all city-related public records sent to or received at council member doors, Friends of Julie, which is in quotes, Facebook site um, from 2014 to 2016, or any such records in possession of the city. Um, so the city conducted a search of its official Facebook page, the city's page, for any records it sent to the Friends of Julie Dore Facebook page, and it didn't find any records. Um, the city also searched its archiving system for all documents uh, sent and received with the term, quote, Friends of Julie Dore, and located one message to a city email address inviting the recipient to like as you know, you like something on Facebook, to like the Julie Dore Facebook page. So the city produced a copy of that message to West. Um, this was not sufficient for West, so he filed an action against the city saying that they violated the PRA by not disclosing posts on the Friends of Julie Dore Facebook page. 
and the city filed a summary judgment mo motion, and that's a, a motion that's not in trial. Um, and they argued so that they don't have to go to trial for those who aren't lawyers. Um, and they argued the posts were not public record. Um, so the city, uh, in support of its motion, submitted a de declaration, which is just a statement of facts um, from council member Dorr. And she said, the Facebook page did not contain any information related to the conduct of city government or the performance of any government function. She said the Facebook page was not to conduct any governmental function and hadn't been used or referenced by the city at a city meeting or cited in support of any agency action. She also said the page was publicly accessible and the account had received only one private message, which was kind of immaterial to anything. She also said the Facebook page was a campaign site used for campaign purposes and to provide information to her supporters. She didn't say who made any post on the Facebook page, but she denied that she was the person who actually made the post. So even though in this case the court found information about city business on the Facebook page, it wasn't prepared by Dora in her official capacity. So the court said it's not a city record. The court stressed that if the posts were, were made in her official capacity, then it would be a city record. Um, the court in making this decision re relied on two cases and those cases held elected officials text messages on private cell phones were public records when they were prepared in the owner's official cap capacity. They also held that emails on a personal email account are public records if they meet criteria for the public record, for a public record under Washington law. Um, so very interesting case. Uh, let's move on to the next one. This is a federal case. And this next case is about Twitter. Um, the case is Johnson versus the CIA. And this case um, took place in Massachusetts. Um, the plaintiff in this case sought records pertaining to the CIA's Twitter account at CIA. The plaintiff in this case, um, whose name is Dr. Amanda Jones, was a PhD candidate at MA, MIT and a research affiliate with Harvard University um, when she made the FOIA request. Uh, she sought several records related to the Twitter account, including emails, documents, training materials, and the like. Like, rather. Um, most relevant to our discussion topic today, she sought a list of user applications um, that were connected to the CIA's public-facing Twitter account. Um, this information is stored on the at CIA account page and can only be accessed by logging onto the Twitter account. The CIA denied this FOIA request. Um, the CIA said it had conducted a search of its own records, excluding the Twitter account, and did not conduct a search of the Twitter account for the requested list. It responded to the FOIA request stating that it did not possess the, the records requested um, because they weren't on the CIA server or in the CIA's control. Um, the court found that this search was inadequate. The list that the requester sought was on the agency's Twitter account. Since the agency controlled the Twitter account, it should have searched for the record according to the court. The court reasoned the makeup of the requested list of applications is controlled by the agency's own decision with regard to its Twitter account. This shows that Twitter has significantly relinquished control over this page to the agency. Even if not hosted within the agency's record system, the agency has enough ability to manipulate and use the record so that the list constitutes an agency controlled record for FOIA purposes. So the court ordered the CIA to produce the requested list. So the significance of this case is that even though your agency may not control Twitter, if you have a, a Twitter account or other social media account, you're still responsible for that con content. And if you get a FOIA request just saying, oh, the Twitter information, which is here, uh, was, was something that you'll find on your account page, even though Twitter maintains that, 
the court said the government is responsible for producing that information. They're responsible for going to Twitter um, and producing it. So there was a little discussion in that case also about you know, whether they would have to create a record. Um, but as the court said, they were not creating a record. This record exists on Twitter. It's in the agency's control. So the agency should have searched the Twitter account and should have produced it and, in fact, has to produce it. OK, moving on to the next case. This case is Davidson versus Randall. Um, it's related to the social media policy, which I'll be discussing um, next. Um, this is a, a case uh, from our neighboring jurisdiction, the District of Columbia um, in Virginia, Virginia and Loudoun County. Um, just as a personal note, um, Judge James Wynn is from North Carolina. Um, I was a, a law clerk at the North Carolina Supreme Court, and I got to know him um, well. And I'm not going to go into this opinion, but it's a very colorful, it's an interesting read. It's The facts are um, something that, that you probably encounter in your jurisdiction um, with, with school boards. Um, so here's a, a, a brief summary. Um, so this case is concerning a Facebook page as well. Um, the Fourth Circuit in this case, um, which is, is over Virginia, held that where the chair of the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors banned a constituent from posting critical comments on her chairman's Facebook page, the constituent had standing under Article Three of the U.S. Constitution for declaratory relief because he demonstrated an injury in fact and there was a credible threat of future bans on the content based on the chair's Facebook post. The court further held that the chair's social media page constituted a public forum for the purposes of the First Amendment. So in this case, um, Randall, who is uh, the chairman um, on her uh, campaign Facebook page, she had several Facebook pages, but on her campaign page, she referenced her chair's Facebook page as her county Facebook page. Um, she went on to say, I really try to keep back and forth conversations as opposed to one-time information items such as road closures on my county Facebook page, Chair Phyllis Randall. I mean, that, that was significant um, because, again, it goes to um, control of the page and um, the court will go on, go, went on to discuss that later. Um, so here are some of the facts. I mean, if you have time to read this case, it's actually pretty interesting um, based on the facts. But um, Davidson, who is the plaintiff, was an outspoken resident of Loudoun County. Um, this is, I'm just reading from the opinion. Um, apparently largest, largely focuses his civic engagement and expression on the funding and management of public schools. To that end, he has repeatedly expressed concern about school board members failing to disclose personal conflicts as required by law before voting on financial transactions before the school board. On February 3rd, 2016, Davidson attended a Loudoun Town Hall meeting that included the Loudoun County School Board and Randall. At the meeting, Davidson submitted a question implying that certain school board members had acted unethically in approving financial transactions. Randall volunteered to answer the question but characterized it as a setup question that she did not appreciate. Shortly after Randall answered the question, and while the town hall meeting was still ongoing, Davidson posted a message on Twitter, which he tagged Randall, at Chair Randall setup question. You might want to strictly follow FOIA and the COIA as well. Drama. <laughs> Later that evening, Randall posted about the town hall meeting on the chair's Facebook page, describing what was generally discussed at the meeting. In response, Davidson then used one of the Facebook pages he manages through his personal Facebook profile, Virginia SGP, which Davidson frequently uses to post political commentary to comment on Randall's post about the town hall meeting. Although neither Davidson nor Randall remember the precise content of Davidson's comment, 
Randall testified that it contained accusations regarding school board members and their families' putative conflicts of interest related to municipal financial transactions, suggesting, in Randall's opinion, that school board members have been taking kickback money. Randall stated that she had no idea if any of the accusations were correct, but she determined that the post was probably not something she wanted to leave on the chair's Facebook page. Randall then deleted the entire post, including her original post regarding the town hall meeting. Davidson's comments and replies there too, and all other public comments were deleted. Randall also banned Davidson Virginia SGP page from the chair's Facebook page, which precluded Davidson from using his Virginia SGP page from commenting on the chair's Facebook page. The next morning, about 12 hours later, Randall reconsidered her actions and unbanned Davidson's Virginia SGP page. So the court, in essence, um, found that the chairman's actions violated the First Amendment um, by creating this chair's Facebook page. She created a public forum where people can express their, con their opinions, good or bad. Um, so the court is saying that if you have a Facebook page, you can't ban people um, from commenting. You can't delete them etc. Um, so this, the court found this is viewpoint discrimination and the chair violated the plaintiff's freedom of speech rights under the First Amendment. Um, so again, as we're going to discuss next, um, it's important to have a social media policy so that people in the government understand um, what they are subjecting themselves and the government to um, when they decide to conduct government business over social media. Um, so our next topic is developing a social media policy, which I highly encourage. <laughs> um, issues to consider. Um, ensure that the agency has proper procedures in place to retain social media posts and associated comments with respect to official agency as opposed to social personal media accounts. I'm going to put the caveat that if you're conducting uh, social uh, media activity on your private account in your official capacity related to your position, that it might be subject to FOIA. Um, so you might want to let folks know that as well. Um, you need to clarify that, that the use of personal social media accounts um, should not be used to create public records. Um, you should also provide guidance to agency officials and employees regarding best practices in their use of non-government and social media accounts. So look at these cases um, that I've discussed and other issues and kind of provide guidance on to, you know, what could happen um, from a, a negative perspective um, with a, a use of non-governmental social media accounts by a government official. Um, so next, there are several key elements um, of an agency social media policy. Um, it, it, the policy should uh, note that content posted to the agency's social media account is a public record. You should let people know that. Um, it requires agencies to maintain the social media account content in accordance with applicable retention requirements. Um, so most jurisdictions have a record retention um, schedule that includes electronic records. Um, so social media policy should mirror um, that document retention um, schedule. Um, a social media, a good social media should also encourage posting of copies instead of original public records on social media to avoid retention problems. Um, so again, for example, you know, as, as I stated earlier, our office um, enforces the DC Open Meetings Act and online um, we have copies of agendas. So those can be seen as records um, that need to be produced. So if you would put the record on social media, that would be um, a secondary posting as opposed to putting the original. A little confusing, but 
again, if you have original document, it's good to have that document somewhere other than social media and just do a repost of the official document. Um, what's posted on government social networking sites is public information. Um, government employees and officials should not post non-public information or information that is generally covered under a FOIA exception under social media, in social media. So example, um, personal information, addresses, things of that nature are um, file under a FOIA exception that you wouldn't have to produce. But if you go ahead and put it out on social media, um, you might um, destroy that privilege. Um, government agencies cannot avoid confusion, lawsuits, and other problems with a strong social media policy. Um, next, a strong social media policy should have the following elements. It should include a well-defined purpose and scope for using social media, develop standards for appropriate public interaction, set forth guidelines for posting of comments and responses, establish guidelines for record retention and compliance with FOIA laws, and last, include an employee access and use policy. Um, so based on the, the last case, um, as you see, you need to give your employees and officials guidance on what to do with social media, um, what to do in their official capacity and in their job on social media. Um, so a good, strong policy should, should mention that. And lastly, um, the social media policy should be in place before um, establishing Facebook, Twitter, or other so social networking sites. Um, from a practical standpoint, if you don't have one already um, and you're already on social media, um, you should get one as soon as, as possible or encourage your organization um, to do that. Uh, the social media policy will govern the administration and monitoring of site content. It should set forth ground rules for public input and comment and adopt policies for employee usage of social media. And I would also encourage that um, the social media policy be made public. Um, a lot of times government policies are on intranet sites and not on public facing sites. Um, and that could be a, a mistake again because um, the public doesn't know what to expect from social media and the government or can make assumptions. But if you, if you create that policy and you put it out there, that can save you a lot of problems um, later you know, with constituents um, understanding what the forum is. So lastly, I'm going to discuss um, social media retention methods. Social media uh, brings up new challenges respecting public records requests. Government email and paper records exist in static form when created. Now, most governments have in place systems to automat automatically preserve records such as email and paper. Um, social media records, however, have characteristics that make it difficult and challenging to retain. Um, first, they exist on a platform that the government does not own. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube are all third party platforms that have no responsibility to retain government records. So you can't rely on these private entities to produce your records. Um, as I, the court in the CIA case uh, said, it's clear that uh, government agencies are responsible for this content when they have control over their Twitter page. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, they include content the government does not control social media sites. Um, the public posts and comments on government um, social media pages change daily. Um, the people who post control what they post. Um, they have the ultimate ability to delete, edit, and hide content. But you're ultimately responsible as a government agency for producing this if requested by law. Um, so it's important to figure out well, how are you going to capture it in static form. Um, another problem 
um, is that they have include content that is associated with but not produced by the government agency. So the government is responsible for capturing, preserving all social media content that discusses government business, that official government business. Um, this means that every social media account tied to the government is subject to disclosure under public records law. So like the deleted post in the Davidson case, um, what would happen if uh, Davidson or someone else um, wanted the county to produce it? Um, because he did, what if he decided to delete the post and then someone else had to, um, and someone else wanted it, the, the county would be in, in even further trouble than from shouting, shutting this guy out. Social media archiving challenges keep many government social media use from being compliant with public records law. Um, here are some of the options most frequently used. Um, first, take no action and rely on the social networks to retain records. Second, use a manual process like taking screenshots. Or third, use what's known as a social media archiving solution, a system that captures your social media content in near real time and preserves it in a separate archive, one that's searchable and includes metadata, which is sometimes necessary for re legal reasons of each post. Uh, let's look farther into these uh, methods. So first, relying on the social media networks to capture and preserve media records assumes the social networks will retain all of your content indefinitely. The social networks don't provide user comments and revisions to content, i.e. edited, deleted, or hidden content in their download features. Additionally, the social networks are not subject to open records law and are under no legal obligation to preserve your records. Um, next, manually preserving the records is often inefficient and time consuming. Taking screenshots of social media posts, which can change daily, uses a great deal of government resources. Um, I don't know about your jurisdiction, but in mine, as far as staffing goes, we're really stretched to the limit. Um, so asking someone to take screenshots uh, is not really a, a tenable or um, good method of retention for the district. Um, the screenshots may also not be reliable enough to be admissible in a court proceeding should that come up. Um, third, social media archiving through a government enter enterprise solution um, or a third party service uh, is the best solution available. Social media archiving helps ensure public records compliance by capturing and preserving content created by government and community users. This includes deleted, edited, and hidden content, which is often at the center of records requests. Additionally, it enables stakeholders to search for their records using a variety of filters and keyword searches, allowing the government to have confidence that they have the highest level of compliance with public records law. And again, archiving captures metadata for each post, ensuring that all captured records are legally admissible in court. So I hope this information is helpful to you in your effort to maintain government transparency in your jurisdictions. Um, I'm now going to turn it back over to Stephanie. And again, thank you for your time and for listening. And sorry about the audio problem in the beginning. Thank you so much, Nikal. That was great. Um, we really appreciate you being here and sharing this training with us. It's such a great behind the scenes look at the training that you offer um, to agencies. And I, I'm really honored that we've been able to host you here. Uh, those examples from around the country are just so powerful. And we've got a bunch of questions coming in. I, I definitely want to uh, you know, take some time to answer those. And before I do that, I just want to segue really quickly to you know, just uh, one topic that's kind of near and dear to our hearts here, which are some stories, um, some stories about customers of ours, and stories that are pulled from in the news, where you know you're actually seeing situations similar to the ones you're talking about here. Uh, let me just pull up my slide deck here, and let's see. Okay. 
just one moment, if you can all bear with me. Okay, great, here we go. So this is a little section um, that we like to call CYA, stands for Cover Your Agency. Um, you know, we're really privileged at this point to have over 2,000 agencies working with us, and we always want to point out that, um, you know, even in the middle of all the really super and wonderful benefits that your agency gets from social media, you do need to make sure that you're covering, covering your agency. And, and how can you do that? Nicole definitely covered some of the, the reasons why. Um, she covered some of the ways that you can do it. And we're gonna cover just two quick stories out of the news and then we'll go back to Nikel. So the first story that I wanna talk about here, um, this happened in Washington County, Florida. And what happened here was the Washington County so a citizen in Washington County filed a First Amendment lawsuit against the Washington County clerk after they deleted her comment on Facebook. And then the same citizen actually filed a second lawsuit when the agency could not produce the deleted records. Um, and in the request, the FOIA requested, it said, the clerk of court's office blatantly violated the public records laws. So what ended up happening was the agency ended up paying over 10K to settle the lawsuit because they were not able to produce those records. Um, and this is just a really good example to show that agencies are really actually facing some real legal penalties for failing to archive records of their social media. Um, so just one more quick story. And so this story came out of Northport, Florida. And you know, we had actually um, the PIO from Northport on a webinar with us earlier in the year. And he's great and was completely open and willing to share this story with us. Um, so I can definitely send out that recording if anybody on the call is interested in it. But essentially what happened was the city of Northport received not one, not two, but four social media records requests in a single year. Um, so one was for a controversial post that they had removed from their Facebook page. So it's a post they removed from their Facebook page because it was controversial. And it involved, you know, a, essentially a canine unit that had apprehended a suspect. And the post became really controversial, generated over 700 comments, and the PIO deleted the post. Um, and then, as often happens with controversial posts, they promptly received a public records request for it. Now in this case, unlike some of the other cases we've talked about today, because the city of Northport has a social media archiving system in place, they are prepared for a situation just like this, unlike Washington County Clerk, who, who was not prepared to produce a deleted record, the PIO in Northport, Florida was able to do a quick search under the deleted tag, found the content they needed, and it really gave the city the ability to quickly respond to a records request uh, related to a controversial post. So I know that you know some of you talked about being the specific person who is in charge of archiving, um, in charge of FOIA requests, and what we love to do at the end of these webinars, we try and make these as educational as possible for you, but for folks that do wanna learn more about the actual archiving piece of it, the actual nuts and bolts of how you get this thing set up, um, hint, it's really easy and really quick, and how you can get this in place for your agency, so this is just sort of a, something you do not have to worry about anymore. It's something we just like to take offline. So I'm just gonna throw a quick poll up, um, and you'll be able to say just yes or no. So if you could actually just put a yes in the chat window, if you would like to get more information. Um, we can tell you things like who near you is using a social media archive. We can tell, we can kind of take a look at your particular records request in your state and tell you what you're actually responsible for. Things like that. Go ahead and throw a yes in the chat window. We're not gonna actually do a poll for this one. And I or somebody else who works near me will reach out and help you get the information you need. So we'll leave that open between now and the end of the webinar. And in the meantime, let's go back to some of these questions we have. And if you have questions, please ask them now, um, and we'll squeeze in as many as we can. 
Okay, great. So, Nikhil, are you ready for these? Yes. All right. Question number one. What is the average expected length of time for completing an electronic FOIA request? Do you mean actual completing or what the law requires? I think this question is asking what the law requires. Okay. Um, in D.C., um, we have uh, 15 uh, business days to um, complete the FOIA request, um, and we can have an extension. Um, and in the case of electronic records, we usually have to take that extension. Um, so the courts here in D.C. have told us um, that, like for a voluminous request, like such as an email, um, which is really the context we find this in, um, that we can release the information in in waves, so to speak, so we can give the requester a schedule um, and, and work with them to receive the information to give us time um, to produce the record. Um, and we have a longer amount of time um, to release um, body-worn camera footage, which is in the context of law enforcement. Um, but again, the courts have pretty much said that as long as, as we, we do have to fulfill their request, that we need to keep the requester informed um, about the amount of time we're taking um, to produce it if it's outside the statutorily required time frame. Okay, perfect. All right, moving on to our next question. Would a radio show be considered a meeting? over social media? Um, I'm going to have to fall back um, to your jurisdiction's um, open meetings law. Um, in the district, um, one of the things that was required to have a meeting um, is that a, a quorum um, of, of public body members are there. Um, we've never had the situation of, of, of uh, having a meeting on a radio show. Um, there are usually some requirements about the public um, being able to um, interact um, and participate. Um, so if those requirements um, are, are met, um, then you a radio show could be uh, considered a public meeting. I have to fall, fall back to you know, what, your, what your jurisdiction um, law says. But um, again, if you look at uh, the requirements um, for a public meeting from your jurisdiction, Regardless of the format, um, if the the gathering, so to speak, meets those requirements, it could be considered a public meeting. Okay, great. And for those of you who are interested in finding out the requirements near you, um, if you just put yes in the chat window, we have a great link we can send you to uh, find out the specific requirements in your state. So, okay, next question from Inna. She's asking, I contacted the state of Maryland about the social media retention schedule for how long the cities in Maryland must keep the archived social media records. The state has no such requirements. Does it mean we don't have to keep any removed comments or is there some minimal term for this? Um, I'll have to fall back on your state. It would probably be in, in Maryland, whatever, um, the electronic records retention requirements are. Um, here in the district, um, we have a, a schedule that follows the, the federal schedule, um, but by default for electronic records, we're just keeping everything indefinitely, which I don't think is, is the best way um, to go. Um, it's a, a challenging area, I guess, as the government, um, creates more data, um, trying electronic data, figuring out um, what to keep and, and how long to keep it. Um, a lot of jurisdictions, including the district, haven't um, figured that out. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, in the case of Maryland, you know, I would advise that if um, the law or regulations or policy don't, don't state um, what the term is that you, you keep it um, because you can't really, you can't destroy anything um, without permission and that's what the record retention schedule is. So, um, so I guess 
to, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, got a few more. Again, I think we have a little bit more time, so please keep the questions coming in if you have any. But question from Karenis is, how would a FOIA request work when it comes to shared posts, i.e. a school district sharing resources from the local library? Um, well, FOIA law, generally, if you, um, you are responsible for what you have control over. Um, so it's, it's school district sharing resources from, from the local um, library. So if it's a, a shared, I guess, Facebook account, um, to the, for example, to the extent that you control the account, you will probably be responsible um, for producing the content if you got a FOIA request. Now, if it's something um, that the local library controls, the local library will be responsible for that content. Um, so usually how you would deal with that when responding to the FOIA request um, is you would, would copy or, or, or share um, the request um, if you're in school district with, with the library um, and you would determine who's gonna respond to what. Um, like for in the example that of the case um, where it was a CIA Twitter account, for example, so if this local school library is the one who has control over the whole account and the school district um, can't produce anything without the library, um, then you'd have to just forward the, the uh, FOIA request over to the library because you wouldn't be able to fulfill it because you don't have any control over the site. Okay, perfect. Um, here's a good one from Michael. Michael wants to know, if someone not affiliated with my agency Post an inflammatory, derogatory, demeaning, or otherwise morally questionable statement. Would we be within our rights to delete that post? It's a great question. Um, I would say you could hide the post. I wouldn't delete it. Um, it again, it would go to your policy. So. Um, you don't have a policy in place that that talks about you know the government reserves its right to hide i would hide not delete hide um, a post that's inflammatory or could be offensive um, um, i think then you could do it um, it, it seems the court again by by calling it a, a public forum a, a government page um, it seems at least in the fourth circuit um, which covers uh, virginia north carolina um, that you are not able to delete it, um, so hiding it is you know is, is another another solution. So it's still there, um, and if you did delete it, you know I would make a record of it. Um, but this, the court seemed in the in the um, Fourth Circuit seemed to discuss it in in the manner of it being a a, a public forum, just kind of like if you are out on the street. Um, and you're you're making statements that people can't keep you from talking or protesting, et cetera. Um, and in that case, um, the site was specifically um, created for that purpose, for the purpose of of interacting um, with the public and for public making comments and being able to discuss things with their elected official. Um, so if your um, site doesn't kind of meet those requirements, then I, I think you have more control over. Um, commenting and hiding comments or deleting comments, but you know I would err on the side if this, the feature is available for hiding it or keeping the public um, from seeing it versus deleting it. Um, because again, if it's public business, it could be a public record. Great. These are such thorough answers, and it's so nice to hear them from somebody so knowledgeable. So I really <laughs> appreciate you taking the time to to come in today to talk to us and to share this this firsthand information. Um, I know we're running a little bit over our time. We do have a lot of requests for people who want more information about archiving and or about their specific public records laws. So I promise I will follow up right after this webinar and connect those of you who have put yes in the chat window with the information that you need um, to help you get into compliance and help you be prepared for the types of situations Nikel has discussed today. And if you didn't put yes in the chat window and you still wanted to, go ahead and do that now. Uh, otherwise, I just wanna say thank you so much to Nikel for taking this time today. We really appreciate it and fantastic oh, yeah. presentation. 
Oh, thank you so much. This has been great. And I'm um, so happy to be able to talk to everyone. Great. All right. Uh, and that's all we have for today. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. And we'll see you next month. Bye. Bye-bye.